This is Create the Next from Pro CFO Partners, where every week we explore strategies and ideas for financial management and growth to help today's businesses put their financial picture in context. Welcome back to Create the Next. I'm Chris Bentliff, and I'm joined today by Pat Riquetapane. Pat, it's great to have you back. Last time we had such an energizing conversation. Today we're talking about um, construction companies, which I think is interesting because we're in some really interesting times with the construction industry. Uh, we're coming out of um, the pandemic. We're dealing with inflationary pressures. We're dealing with supply chain stuff. We're dealing with housing constraints and housing concerns and all kinds of stuff. That's interesting, but I think there's a lot to talk about just with um, what are the what are the financial functions that I really need to be thinking about or focusing on? And and what do you see time and time again that construction companies aren't doing or aren't doing as well as they could be or don't even know that they're not doing and it's really preventing them from you know growth or it's really causing them to hit their head against the wall? So welcome. And just tell me a little bit about what you're seeing out there um, when it comes to kind of the financial functions that again and again and again uh, are issues that you think need to be addressed. Uh, I think uh, I think it's a very complex uh, area uh, for a lot of reasons, and it just I mean, just if you just look at the nature of who are in the construction industry, mostly it's contractors, general contractors, subcontractors, and they each have their roles. But uh, in either case, or in both cases, they uh, have so much to deal with. Aside from some of those external factors that you that you talked about, just internally. Rules keep changing. There's compliance issues. Uh, people deal with uh, the government. They deal with unions. There's, there's different kinds of, uh, of of groups that manage, you know, what you should be doing and shouldn't be doing, including AICPA for the accounting rules. And you have uh, like the uh, American Institute of Architects who have their own formats and, and forms that you need to fill out if you're going to be working for usually larger entities or Anyone with an architect, or because they kind of go by by that as their uh, the way to manage you know um, projects and um, and the thing that makes it very difficult for smaller entities in particular is they they don't usually have that much uh, financial experience. They're not they're not uh, used to dealing with balance sheets or income statements as it is, and those are easy compared to what you have to do in the in the construction industry. Uh, there are so many factors, some of them you mentioned, I, I, um, but there are things like, especially during a pandemic, which we've had for the last two years, but, you know, can you get materials, you know, the materials that you need, what's the price, everything's been going up, you know, you're trying to estimate for a job, um, and you can't, uh, because you don't even know if you have staff, I mean, so, so many people lacking workers, and if you do get them, are, are they qualified, are, are they able to do the job? And every single one of these things can can be a significant item on a uh, on a project. And um, as far as the financial things go, obviously the best way to handle construction jobs is to do it on a project by project basis. And what that means is, if if I have a specific uh, address that I'm working on this week, I I really have to run that as if that is my business. And so it's like a mini version of a whole business. It's a whole profit and loss statement. It's on, it has its own dynamics. Um, every job is pretty much different. They, they need different staffing requirements, different resources in general, equipment, materials, you know, et cetera. And, um, and you have to uh, allow for everything when you're doing a, a construction job. And you have to really, the best, I think the, the thing that, that many of the uh, co contractors, again, especially the smaller ones, uh, have to deal with is even knowing how to price a job, how to how, what's available to them to price a job, what method they should be using. But I mean, as far as the job itself, you have to put together a very detailed estimate of what you're going to do. And you should leave enough in there so that you can guarantee you're going to make a profit. It's not that easy to do. You have to account for everything you're going to encounter, everything you're going to need. The timing is critical. Um, very often jobs get delayed for no one's no reason other than the weather is bad or it's or there's some mechanical breakdown or, or who knows what um, you know the electricity goes out. There's um, all every every single contingency you kind of have to um, plan for even if you don't know what the problem is going to be. 
So it makes what they're what all of these people that are trying to get work and then price it out and then actually execute makes it very difficult, I think, in general for them to do that. So I think the more insight they have into what it takes and how to do these things and how to track them so you get a better feel of ongoing for what you have to do and how to do it and not you not just use your instincts see if see if your instincts make sense put everything down lay it all out get the actuals put it against it understand that there are, there are things in there that are not um obvious you know where where maybe you have inventories of things that you use for more than one job you have to allocate the expense you certainly use workers usually for more than one job and uh again you have to allocate their time and their and the labor uh that that they're putting in um and it, it makes it a, a little more difficult to to allocate how much time and effort and everything you're going to need you know then you're faced with accounting issues like you said earlier um for example, what's the best tax treatment? I mean, you could do things on a cash basis, mostly for smaller contractors, and that then that's probably the easiest, and it gives them a little bit of flexibility for taxes. You can, but you're still supposed to match your expenses with your revenue, so it makes it a little trickier at the year at year end. Um, and there are different methods. There's a method of you just you just recognize revenue when you finish the job. Or you can re- recognize it as you go along. It's just called a, a, a percent of completion method, and that's probably the one that's most used, I think. And um, that one makes sense because you keep track as you go along as to where you are, and uh, and you get paid, you know, and you get you recognize revenue as you complete different segments of a project. Let's talk a little bit about this. Um the smaller sort of subcontractors or the smaller organizations, because you hit on something a little bit ago, but uh, I really love the sort of really tactical um, application of it. But first of all, a lot of those organizations, a lot of those companies, a lot of those just, you know, uh, single shingle kind of people, they got into it because they're good at it or because they're interested in it or because they grew up with it or whatever, not because they're fascinated with the finances behind the construction industry. And I think the large organizations will have the resources, but the smaller, I, I think you're right that they don't necessarily think of themselves. Tell me if you agree uh, of themselves as a business. And I love this idea of treating this week's job site as your entire job, because uh, I think smaller outfits sometimes can get distracted with what's next or concerned about what they can't control about what's next or whatever. And so what I hear you saying is focus on now, focus on what you know, and spread out your business relationship. Uh, Project completion makes all kinds of sense. And I think that makes a lot of sense um, because it helps me to put milestones around it that both me and my client, whether that's a, a contractor or a, you know, a homeowner or whatever, can all understand. Uh, do you agree with some of those assessments? And do you think that um, do you think that this idea that the smaller organization needs to uh, kind of recalibrate around not just their skill sets but their business acumen and sharpen those blades as much as they are trying to do a good job out there? I, I think that most most of the people that are doing this are, have very good business instincts, and that's why they're doing it. And they can they can kind of feel their way through jobs and know what they should charge. And they they could just do it by seeing what's what has to get done. That works pretty decently, I think, for small jobs. Uh, the other problem, of course, is that while they're working on one job, they really have to try to get more jobs right? because they don't want any pauses in between earning money. And that's always a problem for entrepreneurs that are, that are single, you know, uh, just one person running something. They have to do the work and do the marketing and get, get the next job at the same time. We've all had problems with, uh, with um, contractors that come in and then, then they disappear and then they come back and they're not, as they don't seem to be reliable. But that's not that's just a, a function of how they're managing their jobs. And but I think the, the one of the most relevant things about managing jobs is understanding all of the aspects of it, the, the, the you know, the resources you need, as I said, the the what it's going to cost. That's extremely important because they can't make money if they're if they're not charging enough, you know, for a job. 
because they've left the things out, you know, uh, or if they can't get the labor they need and it's, it starts to screw up everything they're doing. It, it's, the, you know, timing is, is critical. The, all the elements are critical. And I, so I agree with mostly everything you're saying, especially the pressure that's put on to smaller, you know, contractors to try to, to, try to manage uh, the workload. And they, you know, they don't want to turn down jobs. You know, they don't want to focus on one thing and that's it. But you have to, you have to, you know, make sure that you have a schedule that's going to get get you from one to the next to the next. And if you have subcontractors to help you, it, it can make it easier. It can make it tougher, mm. depending on who you've got working for you <laughs> and how reliable they are. You know, and not, so you know. not for nothing, but the best marketing or sales maybe that I'm going to do is the quality of work I'm doing on this project because that will create a word Absolutely. of knowledge, positive or negative. Yeah. You know, for the next one, one of the things that is resonating with me as you're sharing so much is, wow, I really need to offload this to somebody who knows what they're doing because, uh, you know, that's a lot. I'm really good at this part, or I'm really interested or good at the business dynamics of this part. But so much of what you shared are the the nitty gritty, the details, the costing, the supplies, the uh, the labor, the tax implication uh, implications. Talk to me just a little bit about. Uh, where a fractional and uh, we're, we avoid sort of hard promo here on 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 the show on on create the next, but it's obvious that there are some folks in some industries that are screaming for help. And where can I expect kind of my fractional CFO? What, what kind of collaboration should I expect, or should I look for from them? What should I offload to them to kind of help me figure out? What should they just figure out on their own and report back to me? What should I be? maintaining court kind of in charge and they support that what's that dynamic of that relationship from your perspective i think uh i think uh the cfo can make things a little easier for them in several ways like i said earlier they're not really financial people most of them um and uh but obviously everybody wants to make money and they want to make sure that they're making money they don't want to go into a job work for four months and not make anything it's and, and it happens yeah. And there's a lot of elements to this. And there's a lot of paperwork, a ton of paperwork. As you, as the jobs get a little larger, you have to deal with uh, all of the different compliance things that, that, that they throw in front of you. And um, and so where, where a CFO can help is, number one, is cash flow. If, they, if they're not on top of their cash flow, it's, it, you know, a CFO can certainly lay it out so that it captures the things in advance and after the fact. So it helps them also to, to structure how they're uh, putting a contract together with, with their clients. And, you know, you know, they, again, most of them know mostly by um, instinct what they need to do, that they need to get a certain percentage up front and they, you know, they need to make sure that there's a the time frame for getting paid when, when they complete certain things or, you know, is, is laid out, you know, beforehand. But there's a lot. There's a lot of those things, and um, and a CFO can help kind of put all that together and, and explain to the business owners what it means, what the what's what's the uh, impact of the, of the things that they're doing, and also we can do that in a form of of um, of, of like forms, like like paperwork, and showing them doing a template for cash flow that includes all the things that they're doing, doing something that can accommodate. Uh, all the different projects that they're, that they're doing because they're all different, but they all have certain elements that are relatively the same. But so you can, if you can incorporate that, you can do a forecast for them or a budget or both, and uh, so they know kind of where they're going. You can talk to them about objectives and lay those all out so that they know what they have to do in order to meet those objectives, and then you can show them how to match the the what actually is going on with what they think should be going on. And then you can, you can point out where, where they can improve and what, what they're not doing, maybe what they're not doing right or analyze it correctly. So, you know, make sure they, they have all their overhead items, you know, included in, in, the, in the job, for example. There's something called retainage, which is a very, I think is a very important issue because on almost all jobs, they, they, they're allow five to 10% that they don't get paid, even if they if the job is a, is a you know hundred thousand dollar job, they could they withhold ten thousand dollars until the very end, and a, a contractor can't collect it until the client or the owner or the architect 
says, okay, it's, it's good. And then they can collect it. And sometimes that goes on for months where they don't approve everything or, they, or they're not willing to even look at it. And you know, you're just sitting there waiting for your money. The margins aren't big enough to, to you know, have to deal with that. So a CFO can help them maybe, maybe put enough contingency into something to, to cover them for at least uh, what they're laying out. You know? and, and again, lay it all out and put a process together where possible, maybe get some uh, technology involved that can help, you know, help yeah. uh, see things a little easier. And uh, that's, I mean, there's a lot a CFO can do. And, and it can also just verify that what they're thinking is correct, you know, or not. <laughs> so if, if they're not allocating things properly, they could be missing big segments of, of costs that they, they, they haven't considered, for example. It's so valuable. And <laughs> I mean, there's so much to think about. And you're right. I mean, um, the opportunities are are huge, but also the the opportunities for uh, for growth, the opportunities for revenue growth, the opportunities for better cash flow, but also the consequence of not having those things. I love this specific example you're sharing where my work is done and it was done three months ago, but there's still right. a chunk of change we haven't had access to because of you know processes outside of our control. What a killer for, for cash flow. And now uh, I'm struggling with all sorts of dominoes that are falling after that because as you point out, I didn't have the contingencies or the mitigations or the strategies to, to help me lay that out. I think that's one place where financial guidance, uh, like a CFO, like pro CFO partners can, can help to, um, you know, to really smooth that, that process a little bit. Do you feel like if there's one in all of your experience, as we, as we kind of sign off, is there one golden nugget? I'm putting you on the spot. One golden nugget where, Please start to do this differently than you were doing it yesterday. Is it uh, think of the job site as your only job this week? Is it plan ahead with uh, you know better foresight? What do you think is the one thing that you see again and again and again? I think uh, it's hard to specify that that exact, but I think they have to do a couple of things. I think a lot of it is emotional. I mm -hmm. think they have to have the confidence in what they're doing, and I think helping with all of these tools can give them you know, that extra confidence. I think they don't necessarily have to do this job and only this job, That's maybe for a sole practitioner, but, but for uh, people that are large, a little bit larger, but not gigantic, they have four, five or six jobs, they could run them, but they have to know they can run them. They have to believe in the, in the numbers that they put together and, and that they're, those are reasonable and, it's, and they make sense and they're gonna make a profit. So I think it's a lot of it is mental. A lot of it is getting them to the point where they feel confident about what they're doing because it's working out and the numbers are coming in the way they're supposed to and they've been planned and that's because they've been planned carefully and, and everything's been thought through and they can see it quickly and easily. I don't that's not I don't know if that's exactly an answer to that question. That's a great but, answer. You know <laughs> that's a great answer. If I'm out there and I'm I'm running a I'm running a construction company of any size, uh I, I hope I've been furiously taking notes because this is fascinating. And as we said before we uh before we started, Pat, we I think we've scratched the surface. We've scratched the surface yeah. of the surface. I think there's a lot we can get into, and I'm looking forward to doing that uh in more episodes down the road. Okay, that's great. And I, I'm always happy to be here. It's always uh, fun while it's uh, you know a lot of talking, but it's fun. Oh, it's fantastic. <laughs> I, I enjoyed it a lot. Pat uh, Arcatapani from ProCFO Partners, the genius that you should probably get in touch with uh, to help you grow and maintain and uh, and strategically succeed in your construction organization. Thanks, Thanks Pat. For watching. It's been great to be with you. And a special you. thanks to our subscribers. Consider becoming one today. Visit ProCFOPartners.com for more strategies and ideas for financial management and growth to help you put your business's financial picture in context.